Um, I'm a product guy at Google. Um, I think I'm one of the sort of longest standing folks who are working in uh, Google's cloud. Uh, let me just present. All right, um, let me back up here. And so what's the product guy from Google doing here, speaking to, uh, to everyone? Um, so it turns out at Google, we've got some really interesting technical infrastructure. Um, we talk about it a little bit, we write papers on it, um, and it's pretty cool. It's very modern. Uh, we launch a lot of containers, like we've, we've used Linux application containers extensively. Uh, we launch about two billion in a week. Um, and my job as a product guy is to take that awesome uh, Google technical infrastructure and bring it out into the world. And, and more specifically, um, my not so secret objective is to try to create a really healthy business selling that awesome technical infrastructure to the world. And so my mission has been to bring a new class of cloud service to market. Um, and it needs to be modern, it needs to match our infrastructure, it needs to really build on the technology and expertise that we've had for forever. Um, and so I started thinking about this a lot and worked with some of the, uh, my, my sort of co-founders of the Kubernetes project. And one of the ideas we came up with is, look, we're doing something brand new. It's very different to anything the world's seen. Um, and we were very worried about introducing something that is endemic only to Google, that only works on Google's infrastructure. And so it's pretty clear to us that we needed to be a little different in our approach to bringing this infrastructure to market. And what we wanted to do was lead with open source. This is a pretty new thing. Like, let's create a cloud service. And instead of just like trying to build a service around some existing open source project, let's go build the open source project and then um, offer up a cloud service that's, that's built upon it. And so that's, that's really what Kubernetes is about. And that's what we're here to, do, to talk about. Um, so let's just cover it in a couple of words. Um, like, let me just get a show of hands. How many folks here have heard about Kubernetes or know broadly what it is? Um, OK, great. So I don't have to go into too much detail. Um, but as I mentioned, Google's big into Linux application containers. Um, if you actually track back in history, I'm not going to go into all the details. Um, but we looked at Linux application containers as solving a really gnarly resource isolation problem. So we could, um, we could like, package things up very carefully and run a lot of uh, containers on the same physical piece of infrastructure and achieve very high levels of utilization, basically use every piece of the animal. Um, and that's really important when you're running a business of, of Google scale. But we didn't solve a, a pretty important problem with these technologies, even though we'd open sourced them, which was making them really accessible to, to developers, to engineers. Um, along came Docker. Docker did an amazing job of popularizing these technologies. They solved a really gnarly packaging and deployment problem. They made containers accessible to engineers. Um, and they created a great way to put your code into a container and then run that container somewhere. But neither Docker nor Linux applications and containers themselves had actually solved some of the problems that we thought were really important. Um, so neither created a fabric or an environment for an application to run in. Neither were providing a set of common services that that container package technology could just bet on independently of where it was running. And neither was doing much to handle a lot of the, the realities of application lifecycle management, like health management, doing seamless updates, dealing with the orchestration, the mechanics of keeping an application running. And so uh, we decided through Kubernetes to, to, to bring uh, those capabilities to, to market. And it's inspired by a lot of the technologies we use inside Google. Projects uh, codenamed uh, Borg and the project that, that followed called Omega um, were really some of the underpinnings. And if you actually look around the room, you can see people like Brian and Tim and some of the other guys that built out those, those in the early systems with the architects of those systems. And so we've been very lucky in being able to conscript some pretty expert folks to actually help us build this stuff. Um, and so Kubernetes creates this cluster environment for containers. It solves some really hard problems, and we, we like it a lot. And then, of course, there's Google Container Engine, which is our hosted version of Kubernetes. And coming out of the gate, it just solves a lot of the operational problems of running the cluster. But over time, it'll provide a better, stronger, faster way to actually run uh, these, these cluster-based applications. So I'm going to spend a few minutes trying to give you a sense of some of the inspiration for this. Like, what does it mean? Like, why, why, are, we, uh, why are we doing this? What do you experience with it? Um, so I don't know how many of you have seen The Matrix, but I always kind of wondered about the choice of taking that red pill. Like, um, particularly if you're a sysadmin. Life's hard enough as it is. Do you really want to live in a world of kind of crazy infrastructure and all of the, sort of the, the, the details of that? What a cluster environment or creating this cluster first way of thinking about application management is it gives you this world where you're blissfully abstracted away from the horrible and dark realities of your infrastructure management, right? It's a much nicer world. You don't have to deal with you know, a, lot of, a lot of difficult things. 
And so Kubernetes naturally brings things like microservice architecture to, uh, to developers that are trying to run applications. It allows the separation and specialization of operations. That's a really important factor. Like this is one of the things that's made Google really powerful is we have a small set of really intense, really dedicated people that build and manage the underlying services, and then we have a, another set of people that are perhaps less intense, you know, running applications on top of them. Um, and that specialization of, of, of apps is good. And then the other piece is just being able to bet on a set of services. I want to monitor this. I want to log it. I want to connect it to the internet. I want to be able to, um, you know, wire it up to some other things that I might depend on. Creating an environment that offers up those services and abstracts away where they're running, just makes them seamlessly available to your containers, is very powerful. So the second inspiration for this is, is a recognition that dynamic systems often just run better. So I don't know if, if, if you ever flew remote control airplanes. I've had one for a little while, and I crashed into the ground, and it, uh, it, it, it turned into a, like 100,000 pieces of balsa wood. Um, turns out, if you actually apply modern systems, there's things that machines do better than people. One of those things that machines do better than people is, is fly little airplanes or fly little drones, right? And the model with this is, you have a system that's taking inputs and making a very informed set of decisions based on your intent, right? So when, you, when you're piloting one of these little drones, you have a little iPad and you say, hey, go up. I'm not saying like, you know, increase, um, you know, thrust on these things. The system's making those decisions for you. And so one of the things we want to do with Kubernetes is bring this ideal of dynamic control systems to market. Because systems just, like, machines can do some things a lot better than people. And one of those things they can do better than people is dynamically run your applications. And so creating an intent-driven uh, system is good. And what this materializes is like massive re reliability gains. Because you have something that's actively watching your application. It knows when things go bad, and it knows how to correct it and actually remediate the situation. And radical efficiency gains, because you can pack things together and turn them down when they're not in use. You don't have to set aside a lot of idle capacity. Um, so that's, that's the second thing that, that um, you know, Kubernetes really brings. Um, the final thing that I, I, and I mentioned this earlier, but I, I just want to push on this point a little bit. If you're in the business of cloud services and you're not an open project, you are a massive competitive advantage, disadvantage today. Like, I've been humbled by the amount of acceleration we've got out of our open source community, particularly from uh, the, the community as a whole, creating this very strong and rich virtuous cycle where you know, um, our engineers will put something out there and get very immediate feedback and you know, like work with the community to make sure that it works and it, it fits. Um, and frankly, our partners have been hugely important in, in progressing our, um, our technology and, and, and making, making Kubernetes real. For instance, um, right in this room, there's a bunch of guys from Red Hat. Red Hat has brought an incredibly valuable enterprise-centric view of these technologies. And the Red Hat engineers have actually worked very hard to make um, Kubernetes work well for the set of customers that, that Google perhaps doesn't have normal access to, you know, that you know, our, our, our clustering engineers don't have access to. Um, and then we have people like CoreOS that have actually provided a lot of the basic building blocks that we can build on, and they've been working very closely with us to make this come together. And so that ecosystem as a whole is creating a lot of power for the project, and, and it makes us very happy. And another piece to this is just making sure that everything's modular. You know, we recognize that this is a pretty complex system. People want to plug out pieces. And so we've, we've taken modularity very seriously and made sure that things that can be plugged out um, are able to be plugged out, and we encourage people to take the, take the system and, 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 and work on it and build it out as, as it, to meet their needs. So I'm going to wrap it up um, with a, a quick statement of the road ahead. Um, and I, I don't know, some of the folks in this room were in earlier sessions today where people were talking about, like, what does the world look like 18 months out? Um, I thought I'd just take a, a sort of a wild swing at, you know, where do I want to go in five years? Like, where's this going to end? Like, what are we going to do when these kind of technologies are... Um, are, are ubiquitous. And, you know, obviously we're going to have a production version of Kubernetes, you know, very soon, I think by summer. I hope I'm not um, speaking out of turn for my engineers. Um, but, you know, beyond that, I think in the limit, there's a couple of things that are going to really change the game when these types of technologies and this approach to management become ubiquitous. Um, the first thing is, like, a radically higher level of visibility, right? So if everything's running in this, um, you know, blue pool style cluster environment, you have a lot of insight into what's running, where it's running, which version of it's running, what potential vulnerabilities it has, um, and you're able to you know, generate that view. And that, that ultimately leads to a lot more uh, insight, um, and it also leads to a lot more control. So we can create this, um, this empowered decentralization where you can, like someone who has to deal with central functions can look across their entire environment um, and, and also apply policy, um, you know, define a specific set of policies and make sure that things with vulnerabilities cannot physically run in that environment. Um, 
The other thing that I think is going to happen is we're going to see a much stronger separation of, of the operations functions. And this is a really important thing. And like, I think this has made Google so powerful. The ability to start thinking about infrastructure operations as a small and specialized discipline that just deals with the racking and stacking of infrastructure. The ability to think about the cluster and common services operations as being I said a small team that provides a very useful and common set of services to a very broad array of people. And then application operations is something that exists on top of that. Um, I think the world will be more secure, frankly, because uh, when you're running in these types of environments, the application is being run for you. Um, so you can run with a very low set of privileges. You don't have to give your developers direct access to all of your production machines to deploy stuff. But you can also get a lot more insight. You can do anomaly detection. You know if something's been owned in your system. Um, and so that's going to be a far better world. And then, you know, obviously, you know, kind of going back to the matrix theme here, a lot more AI power, the ability to actually rely on very smart, dynamic systems to make, you know, moment-to-moment -moment informed management decisions. Restart this, move that. This is being interfered with something else. That push you did um, broke this other thing. Um, that type of that type of behavior that we we benefit from inside Google will be available to the outside world. And so, to sum it up, um, we're really excited to be working with this community. Our aspiration is to bring this technology to the world. Um, and we hope that it will run you know, well everywhere. And obviously, we hope that uh, no one loves you or your money better than we do. So we hope to create a delightful service for you to uh, run it on our infrastructure. Um, thank you.